Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Both joined by Drew Galloway, and we are here today for your weekly recruiting update for K-State football. We keep you in the know each and every week on what the Cats are doing on the recruiting trail, which right now heavily focuses on the class of 2025. And the guy that has been at the very top of the 2025 big board for a long, long time is been you know listed as a K-State lean for a long, long time as well is Lincoln Cure out of Goodland. And it's significant news with Lincoln Cure because he's not committed anywhere. There's no changes really. But he did get the bump to five-star status, and he is now the number 26 recruit in the country, number two tight end, and inexplicably the number two Kansan. Never once before could you have had somebody like this to be this high and there's maybe only a handful of other years where you could have gone through and said, yeah, you're going to be the number 26 player in the country, but not even the top Kansan. Uh, that's the the world that Lincoln Cure lives in right now. He is number two there, but a five-star, he got the bump on 24-7, so his industry ranking went up. And uh, it'll be interesting to see once on three and some of the others also do their bumps because things could easily change. Because on three, it's not like – on three is not sleeping on Lincoln Cure by any means. If you go no. and look at uh, his most recent ranking there uh, when it came out, I mean, he on three has him 39th in the country. So it, it could very well be coming very soon to where he goes up even higher. And then obviously you're waiting to see if the uh, other two slouches in the recruiting industry uh, decide to hop on board. But it's, it's always good for people to kind of get an update and an idea of where the Lincoln Cure thing sits. So, As we are here right now, he's going to get ready to uh, start taking official visits, I believe, next weekend, correct, is when he'll start those up uh, because he'll have state track this weekend. Uh, Where where do you feel on uh, how good K-State should be right now with Lincoln Cures on a scale of 1 to 10? Just make it simple for you there. 1 to 10. 1 bad, 10 good. How likely is it that Lincoln Cure gives K-State good news uh, in the next month month, month and a half? I'd say probably like an eight or a nine. Like, I I don't think that it's really 10 for me is like, we have confirmation that he has already committed for anybody. Like that's the only time that I'll like go on record and say 10. So spoiler alert for like future shows and references. When I say 10, that means like we're pretty sure, but eight or a nine in this day and age is probably about as close to a hundred percent as it can get, even though it's like 80 or 90%, but that, that's just kind of how it works now, but no news is good news. And I, I, I think I keep saying that with Lincoln cure, like there's no alarm bells that are going off. In fact, quite the opposite. Actually, if you read uh, what uh, Derek posted uh, earlier today, as you're watching this on uh, the KC online message board, that it it's sounding even better than before. So it's kind of playing out like Avery Johnson did with K-State. And I think that that's a great comparison that Derek ended up making. And it's ironic that it's also Oregon again that is involved with uh, Cure, just like they were for Avery Johnson. But I think that the ball is probably at like the the two-yard line and you're trying to punch it in during the official visit. And with how K-State is and how they handle their business on official visits and unofficial visits, I can already tell that this is going to be a very good official visit for him and they're going to be able to, to make it unique because you have to remember this is probably going to be his eighth, ninth, tenth time in Manhattan mm-hmm. as a recruit. So you, they're going to do something to make it unique. And, and you found last year with Caden Massey and Michael Boganowski, they ended up not getting Boganowski but got Massey. Then one of the unique things that they did was have uh, brunch with the president of the university. They did other stuff along that line as well. So I just I have a lot of faith that they can knock it home on the official visit because I I've said for literally since the time that he was offered, I would be surprised if he ended up anywhere else. And I think that ultimately Oregon probably just a little bit too far. Texas A&M kind of the same deal. And then K-State KU just kind of comes down to where the programs are at, I would say. Brunch with the president. Is that how K-State landed a chore chore? There you go. Probably not. Probably, probably. I would guess probably not. I would not. guess probably not. <laughs> probably but, the opposite there. But I, I just think that there's going to be a lot of things going K-State's way with his official visit and how his recruitment ends up going. 
you guys have to remember it in March or April, I think it was April when he visited uh, K State in the spring. He told me that this was after he'd gone on several visits at that point, that the K State visit was the best one that he had gone on during the spring. And it just seems like, you know, I, I think people can have kind of K State brain on this and misremember, but I, I can't recall a time where, you know, throughout the entire recruiting process or down the home stretch, there had been, it had been ba- basically mutually assured or the thought was mutual that you know the recruit thought hey k-state is probably the top choice right now which is every indication from lincoln cure has seemed like hey k-state is right in the thick of it towards the top and then you know k-state can close it out like i think if those things are in line you're going to get that kid on an official visit it's really not anything to melt down about or freak out about but because there is that element because people see Five star K State's not supposed to get those guys, and and so many others are still involved because his K State OV is the twenty first. Next weekend he will go to Lawrence and CKU, and then the week after that he's down to see Colin Klein at Texas A and M, and the following week, the week before the K State visit, he's going to go to Eugene and see Oregon, who seems like the number two option here. Um, with all of these, I I don't think I think A and M is the one that I, I'm least. I would, you know, and again, we're not concerned about any of these people right now. But if A and M is the one I would discredit the most out of those, because I think I can paint a picture uh, as to why the other ones might be the choice. K State is obvious. Oregon, they've seemingly been right in the thick of it as one of the top two or three teams the entire time. Uh, they're going to get that visit right before K State, and then on the KU side. Uh, they just took Lincoln Cure's older brother as a walk-on. So how much does some of that stuff impact the Lincoln Cure recruitment, if at all, in your mind? I think that him or his brother going to KU doesn't impact it a ton, but it impacts it some. I think that that probably is what ends up having him take his official visit to KU uh, May 31st next weekend over, I think it was Penn State that was originally supposed to have him on campus. So I think it was enough to get him there, and it's probably even enough to get them over Texas a and But it's just felt like it's been K-State and Oregon for what has felt like the last four months with K-State still pretty out in front. Uh, the the one thing that I would also like play into this with his rating and everything, and, and again, I'm just piggybacking off of what Derek has said, and I mean, I, I've brought it up too, that his rating getting changed recently has nothing to really do with what he is as a prospect for from our perspective he is all he's always been this borderline five star maybe the highest four star uh potential out there so like for me when i saw it i was more upset because i was like okay well i want to know what has really changed in this time frame because he's done some stuff on the seven on seven circuit and with his track stuff but if you had watched him even last year, you, you can tell that that's a guy that's probably in the top 30 of the country. So that was more of my little quibble and where I'll, I'll stand on my soapbox and argue with this guy about how he probably should have been rated this high to begin with. But I, I, I'm excited to see where it ends up going because I think that in the end that Casey will probably win out. And we kind of got further confirmation that if Colin Klein hadn't have left for Texas A&M, that he probably would already have been committed by now and probably would have committed in January or so. Yeah, which is, you know, an unfortunate wrinkle for K-State, but I think it's also a testament to how they've been able to to recover and keep this yes. thing, you know, online. It, it's never dipped to where Oregon was in the lead, and I think that that is an important thing to really note that, hey, this happened and he might have committed in January if Colin Klein wouldn't have stayed, but it was never a deterrent to get Oregon in front for a little bit, and I think that that shows how much KC has really prioritized him. Yeah, uh, I'm just doing some some quick checking here. Um, I'm not going to go back all the way just because I, I, you know, it's not worth it, but I went back as far as uh, it, it registered in my head. We're talking about him being the number two recruit in the state of Kansas right now. Um, in addition to 2025, do you know in the last 15 years, uh, a little it's more than that, but uh, so, I mean, and I'll, I can go check a little more for you, but I'll be really specific. In the last 17 years, confirm 17 years, 
Do you know the other two years uh, that he would not have been the number one recruit in the state? And do you know who those two players would have been? Um, my guess is one is like that 2010 class because that wasn't that Bryce Brown, Arthur Brown, Chris Harper, all those guys. Was that 2010? Uh, you're you're a little late on 2010. Ooh. Uh, is it a uh, 11 then? No, uh, you need you need to go oh. backwards. Yeah, oh, you need oh, to be. Oh, 2009. Yeah. Yep. So, so I, I can confirm last 20 years at least. Uh, so yeah, 2009, the top recruit was Bryce Brown. There you go. Uh, he was number eight in the country, obviously went to Tennessee the year before 2009. So 2008, that was Arthur Brown. He was also the number eight player in the country, obviously ended up at Miami. And then both of those guys found their way back to K state worked out really well for one of them. And really, honestly, worked out really well for the other because he only the played in like drafted. three games and he got drafted and actually had a really solid NFL career. So uh, that is that's those are just the breaks. And I, I'm sure that it's not like the biggest deal in the world to Lincoln Cure, uh, but certainly it's one of those things that you reflect on right now. It's like when when would this ever have been a possibility? And there's only three possible years in the last 20 that Lincoln Cure would not be the, the top player in the state. And this is one of them. Now, in terms of discussing other top players in the state, uh, let's get a little check in on some of the other guys in the state of Kansas, because we know since Chris Kleiman's come here, K-State's work uh, when it comes to the state of Kansas has gotten better and better, and it's peaked over the last two years. But this year's a little bit different because, you know, it's not just the top talent that is comparable to, you know, 08, 09. There's a very realistic argument and maybe certainty that the class of 2025 is the best that the state of Kansas has ever produced because they have six guys that are four or five stars. They have two inside the top 30, I believe three inside the top 100. They are loaded. So I'll throw the, the top six guys on the screen right there and also who the leader uh, on the on three RPM is at this current point in time. Um, we know that almost all of these guys K-State has had uh, significant contact with at one point or another. I, I would say Juju Marks is the only one that is not in that ball game. Uh, but the other five, we know that K-State has looked around, has had interest in. Um, in terms of where things are trending on these guys, Desan Brame, K-State, we know is not in it anymore. Um, Jaden Woods, K-State, not in it either. And Purdue has seemed like the likely landing spot. So with these top six, Lincoln Cure seems like a, a K-State lean right now. Is there any shot on anybody else in this top six before we delve into uh, some of the, the guys that come in just behind Juju Marks? Uh, I would say that it's probably just going to be Lincoln Cures, the one that they have the best shot for. Andrew Babalola, uh, I'm a little surprised about how his recruitment just dipped. And there was a time where I thought that K-State was probably in the top two, and now it's probably not even the top four, top five. And I would probably honestly say Auburn is that's, in the league. Yeah, for that's kind of what I was thinking. And then uh, Dawson Merritt, I don't think that K-State was really in the game for. Uh, he's the one where it says Kansas kid, but his dad is a position coach for the Chiefs. So that yeah, not really a Kansas native. Uh, Desan Brain, we already know K-State's out for. And I would say that Oregon is probably the likely landing spot for him as well. And it's just funny to me that you probably, if you're a K-State fan, just to really ease up the pressure, you probably want Brain to commit as soon as possible to Oregon. Uh, Jaden Woods, you touched on it, probably Purdue, which is a wild thing to me, but Purdue's done a really good job with his recruitment. And with all the offers that he's had, the most constant name, really up until he eliminated K-State, the most common two names that I had heard were Purdue and K-State, and then he ends up cutting K-State, and then we just hear about Purdue. Yeah. Uh, Juju Marks, that's actually a really good question. I'm I'm honestly not sure where he is going to end up going. Um, I'm, That recruitment has just been kind of... K-State has never really been in it, mm -hmm. so I don't really know a whole lot. And then he was committed to Missouri super early and then decommitted from Missouri, but now he's going back on an official to Missouri, I believe, this month along with KU and somebody else. But that, that's a recruitment that's just been kind of a wild one from the jump, I think. So 
that, that, that's about your your top six of what what's going on there. It is kind of a wild world mixed in with those uh, to see what what's going on. Uh, if if anybody's curious on the the Brame situation, his official visit, unfortunately, to Oregon is the same weekend that Lincoln Cure is visiting K State. So. Uh, unless Brain pulls the trigger before he, you know, starts the official visit, he's probably going to. It's probably going to drag out, and those two might be on comparable timelines in terms of when they they commit. And uh, I guess it'll be. It, it's really going to test to see how strong the the Cure K State connection is because of how the the timing works out of the official visits. So just figured I'd throw that in there for some context for some people. So. The top six kind of weird and wonky uh, the way that it, it, it's worked out. There's a lot of talent, um, but this is one of the things that you find with a lot of talent. Uh, we noticed it last year at the end of the ball game, basically when you know Jay Sean Ross. It was starting to trend that K State mm-hmm. was going to have a real chance to get a, a really talented player out of the Kansas City area, and uh, you know what do you know? Nick Saban oh. and Alabama rolled in at the last minute, so uh, it's probably unfair uh, that Alabama now all of a sudden you know you've got like. 47 other states that you can recruit really well. And now you're all of a sudden you're like, Oh, you know, this the state of Kansas, they might have some guys occasionally. Um, so you're seeing some of these bigger names come in and we know that Dan Lanning has connections uh, around specifically the Kansas city area and throughout the state, uh, the Oregon head coach. So weird situation, but I think you should feel good if you're K state, given the pedigree of these six players that you're in the driver's seat to get at least one of them. And when you consider that, He's right now the second-ranked recruit in the state and could easily end up being the best and one of the best players in the country. Yeah, it's what I've talked about even on the basketball side where if you can land a guy that's ranked near the top, you celebrate that, you take that, and the the misses hurt. But if you can land one or two truly elite prospects, you need to really celebrate that win because recruiting right now especially is just very difficult for every sport because you don't you never know what's going on in the nil world for anybody and you just need to celebrate the wins when they come because when the recruiting wins are fun and and nobody really remembers some of the guys that you lose because the guys that you win and get are more important like the day that avery johnson announced his commitment to k-state one of the top days that i've had at kso (laughs) just the celebration all day because it was an early commit with his uh, announcement ceremony. Mm -hmm. So it was was just a fun day all around, but like there's never been like a miss that has like caused like this huge meltdown that I'm like, Ooh, that was really meltdown worthy. And one that really kind of sticks out to me was from uh, Chris Clement's first of like real and official recruiting class where the, the meltdown came when Kai Thomas committed to Minnesota. And then like two days later, Deuce Vaughn commits to K-State with like little fanfare Mm. Which one? Which one of those had a better college career, Mason? Uh, well, probably the guy that has you know got his three years and got out and is in the NFL now. Uh, I I don't know what Kai Thomas is doing. Kai Thomas is he still was playing Kent, college football. He was at Kent State last year with Jaren oh, yeah, Lewis. That's right, he and Jaron Lewis. So, like, you need to celebrate the wins because the winning is fun, and you can really tell. Like, you can see what's going on with wins losses are bad and like they suck. And I, I well, hate when they lose the prospects too, but and it's- I, I would say this, like the Kai Thomas thing also illustrates what you're talking about, about celebrating the wins because Kai Thomas would have been a celebratory win if they had yeah. gotten him at the time, but so much of recruiting, like half of what you get out of it is not what those guys end up doing on the field. It's just the momentum that you get with getting a high profile target. That's, yes. I mean, that's the that stretch there where Dylan Edwards commits and then Avery Johnson. Obviously, Dylan Edwards the first time around it didn't stick, but that momentum and that you know week and a half, two week stretch there, that was just as good as anything. Like that that was really nice to propel you and give you some of those you know good vibes. And then once you already had Avery Johnson on board, you can take some hits elsewhere, and, and they really didn't do too much of that. So just kind of fascinating. Now in terms of the rest of the state, because it's it's not like just those top six, those are the industry rated guys that are four or five stars because there are guys that cycle in behind them that they also have four star status from different sites and some really good players still out there that could get that bump. Eventually the number seven recruit in the state of Kansas right now is Brock Heath, 
who K-State has had some serious contact with as well. So what's the latest on Brock Heath? Uh, so Brock Heath, legacy to K-State, and it's probably just going to be K-State and Iowa. I don't see anybody kind of like with K-State and Oregon for Lincoln Cure. I don't see anybody else kind of pushing their way up into that top two. Northwestern is kind of a little bit of a sleeper, but I think that they're kind of a distant third at this point. And I believe that his Northwestern visit has already came and gone as I, as I double check here real quick. Uh, but if, if there was a third, I would say that it's probably Northwestern. Yeah. His Northwestern visits already came and gone at this point. Yeah. So they're probably a lot more out of it than anybody else. So I, I would say K state, Iowa, kind of a toss up depends on who you talk to. And it's interesting again, because Iowa has been a team that K state's really kind of butted heads with on the recruiting trail as well. And this is just another one. So offensive line there with Brock Heath, he's a four star on both on three and ESPN. Uh, so that's notable as well. And that's, that's kind of the weird thing where if you go and look at the industry comparison, you can see who's given out the status to each guy. Like Juju Marks, He's a three star and on three 24 seven ESPN, but he's got enough of a bump from rivals to where he gets the industry four star. And then a guy like Brock Heath, who's a four star on two, the, the math doesn't work out quite well enough to give him that bump. It's a strange way that it all happens. Uh, and ultimately that stuff typically works itself out down the stretch. So that'll be one to follow there. Uh, let's go basically south from overland park and we can find ourselves uh down in the coffeeville area keaton jones another offensive lineman that also has four star status from on three uh right now on three likes to favor texas tech and oklahoma state in that but is there any realm where k-state gets involved here i think that there's a chance that k-state can get involved with keaton jones but k-state also offered a little bit later than other schools and from what I've heard and gathered from some other people around that it doesn't seem like he is going to take an official visit to K-State at the moment. And it seems like uh, some SEC programs have kind of turned his head. I know that one official visit is to Missouri, another to Arkansas, and then uh, Tennessee is kind of lingering uh, with Ole Miss as well. So th I think that K-State is probably out of the picture for Keaton Jones, but I wouldn't rule it out if there is something where he doesn't commit over the summer that they could maybe come back and join. We also have to remember too, that if Casey gets Brock Heath and Lucas Algar from St. Louis, that's already three offensive linemen when you added four last year and three the year after that. So you probably don't necessarily need another offensive lineman if you land a top three on your board. Yeah. Uh, another name in the state that we've talked about at different times is Drayton Knowles. So uh, what this is another offensive lineman that's a possibility out there out of Holcomb. Uh, so I know you just mentioned some of the, the Missouri offensive linemen that K-State's in the mix for, but uh, is this one to, to kind of keep, keep an eye on? It's one to keep an eye on, and it probably shows – it will – potentially kind of show where K-State's at and where they think that they're at, because I know that Drayton Noel will go to at least one of the K-State camps this summer. I believe that it'll, he'll be at the offensive line, defensive line camp. And if K-State offers, that probably shows that they want him, because like I said, like K-State does not put out uncommittable offers to Kansas prospects. That's just not how they roll. So if they offer Noel, it'll be a little bit more interesting because then you probably have three guys going for two spots and you kind of just see kind of where the chips fall there. Um, but he's somebody that has an offer, I believe, his power six offers from Duke. And, and I think that he's going to be going to a lot of camps this summer too, trying to accumulate uh, more offers. Old man Drew just referred to it as the power six. Oh, uh, sorry. The, 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 sorry, the power four. Yeah, you're living in 2009 right now. <laughs> you know, Work that out of your system. We were just talking about 2008, 2009. <laughs> True. It's, it's all in my brain right now. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Uh, anybody else in the state right now that, that fans should know that maybe isn't appearing on the, uh, the top list in uh, the state at this point in time? Uh, McGuire Richmond is somebody that is a major, major target and somebody to really know about and kind of think about because he's somebody, if you put a gun to my head and said, who is going to be the next commit to K-State? I think that I would go with him. 
I just think that everything is kind of falling into place. And I've heard a lot of good things from him about K-State and where K-State kind of sits with him uh, really since he was offered. And I'm really interested to see where his recruitment is because remember his brother is one of the starting offensive linemen for Iowa. And it's probably going to be another K-State Iowa, or K and Iowa head to head where kind of like with Brock Keith, the thing that keeps me getting brought up with Iowa is that there's a lot of negative recruitment going on there because nobody knows when Kirk Ferentz is going to retire. Nobody knows what their succession plan is for Kirk Ferentz. If, if slash whim mm -hmm. he ends up leaving. I say if because I I've been surprised before about how long people stay. So it'll be interesting to see kind of where that goes because that that's something that's really been brought up by a bunch of other teams. If they're negatively recruiting Iowa, that's been something that's been brought up. And, and I, I just I wonder how that plays a factor for both Brock Heath and McGuire Richmond. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see that. That's an interesting wrinkle to the to the Iowa situation, especially like, I mean, I know that Kirk Ferentz or has been successful for all these years and blah blah blah, whatever. Uh, but like, if things don't start to kind of flip around, like, I think a lot of Big Ten programs, if they want to, can win eight, nine, ten games every year, mm -hmm. or at least you know the the way that it used to be set up, like. He also may just need to kind of get things flipped around, or he's going to be shown the door, and they're not going to push him, but they are definitely going to say, "All right, you're going to take your right foot, move it forward, and your left foot, move it forward, and we're just going to shut this door behind you and not let you back in." So that's a, a fascinating thing to keep in mind with uh, all these K State Iowa battles as we kind of continue down the stretch here and get further on as we talk about kids that'll be there in the 2025 season and beyond. So that's your K State football recruiting update for this week. Uh, we'll have more on KSO for you, so you can go over, check that out, see DY's full update on the Lincoln Cure situation and much, much more. You can do that at kstateonline.com over at On3 and stay locked in right here on the KSO YouTube channel as well. So we are out of here. We'll be back again tomorrow. We'll keep talking football with you. We'll do a little Big 12 uh, preseason team talk. DY brought it up in his question of the week, so if you want to get prepared for what we're going to talk about, go to KSO. Read that. You'll know what he says. Probably formulate an opinion based off what he told you, and then we're going to tell you why he and you are wrong. So that's our goal for tomorrow. Uh, for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth. Thanks for watching, and uh, again, back tomorrow, talking all Big 12.